Buenos dias and Acapulco, Mexico. Welcome in this exciting and hot city. Today I will talk to the chief developer of Bitcoin Cash. I will interview for you Emery Sachet. He is the visionary and the driving force behind this cryptocurrency. When I record this, Bitcoin Cash has a valuation of 26 billion dollars and is the number four cryptocurrency in the world by the market cap. So please meet with me, Emery Sashi. Hi guys from Acapulco. I will introduce you today to a great guy. This is Omar Sashi, the chief developer of Bitcoin Cash. I uh, wrote the first software that implements it, so I'm okay. a bit more than just a supporter. Right, right. So, uh, uh, Omri, tell me what, what is your history of, uh, of crypto? How did you find out about crypto? How did you start to get involved and what, what were your um, first projects? I've been in crypto for a long time. I discovered Bitcoin in 2010. Okay. Um, but who, like, yeah. who introduced you to crypto? How did you, how did you find uh, a about blogger, a, a Belgian blogger that you know is on the lookout of on new technologies. Blogging in French and English. It's called Plume. Plume. Yeah. So you certainly know Mark de Mezel. Mark de Mezel is another uh, Belgian blogger. I know him by blogger. name, but I don't okay. know him personally. Okay, because a friend of mine, uh, I interviewed him uh, like two weeks ago in Zurich, in a, mm -hmm. also in a crypto meeting. Uh, okay, so uh, and then how did you get involved? So you at first you have you heard about Bitcoin. Yeah, right? I was very excited about the idea of digital cash and you know um, having a money that is not controlled by you know centrally controlled and stuff. But you know for the most part it was taking care of itself. It worked great. Um, so I stayed kind of in the background. But well, as you know, you know over the past two years or so there was this scaling debate where people disagree on how to. Like, you know, there was too much people using Bitcoin. It was causing problem and people disagreed on what to do next. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so the, there was this great debate and it didn't seem to come to a conclusion. And at some point, some people started to, started to uh, make the things USF, happen. Just, you know, the USF movement where some people were like, we're going to activate SegWit. And even if it's the chain, we don't care. OK. And, and because of that, I was like, you know, it's get to a point where people cannot agree anymore. They want to split the chain. Uh, so I decided to work on, you know, the USF, the kind of SegWit, I, I did not really uh, think it was um, the right way to scale stuff. So I was like, you know, if people are going to split, I'm going to want to prepare the other chain. And so I read the software okay. to handle the other branch of the chain. And okay, so the, the main idea behind that was just to increase the, the block size, right? And to scale it that way at, at first, right? Well, not that way. So I'm not very much ideal, like I'm, um, but there are other ideas or to scale stuff, but I'm not quite ready yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a good decision to just, you know, let the experience getting worse and worse until those solutions Absol are ready. Yeah. Uh, especially since, you know, as long as they are not ready, it's only speculative if they are going to actually solve the problem or not. So I'd rather, you know, increase the block size. But also if Lightning Network ends up being a success, we can do Lightning Network and, you know, Whatever, like, you know, pick everything that works, I want to pick. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to be ideological about that. I just want to pick whatever works for users. But what are the, let's say, the next concrete steps uh, for Bitcoin Cash, uh, like on the technology side that you want to take? So uh, is there any like uh, uh, pipeline of the development? Yeah, there are, there are some ideas. Um, so first, there is a lot of stuff that is not very glamorous, but just that you need to do all kind of optimization and reliability mm -hmm. work. Um, that is important to do as you increase the block size. Okay. Like a lot of people think that you can just, you know, change a constant in the code and the block become bigger and everything works, you know, wonderfully. But the truth is that as you, as you grow the block size, there is various problems that start okay. to surface and I you need understand. to fix okay. them as you go, right? So this is... So the, uh, is the, the block size of one megabyte was not just, you know, uh, chosen by chance it, uh, or by accident. It was like probably optimal uh, block well, size I, for I that, that uh, for that setup, right? I think it's more the reverse, right? So the problem that you reach when the blocks are bigger than one megabyte, mm -hmm. nobody was working on those problems okay, because blocks were not bigger than okay. one megabyte, right? Okay. But if you want to grow bigger, you need to make... Like, there is no fundamental problem. It's not like uh, the protocol is broken and doesn't work for bigger block mm -hmm. size, but uh, there is all kind of optimization in the code that you need to do, you know, stuff that 
don't take that much time right now, but as you grow the block size, they take longer and longer and you need to optimize them so they stay. I understand. Um, so things what, keep working well. What, uh, what about, because there is this idea of uh, uh, dynamic block size in mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin Cash, right? So is it that far that you are able to switch it on or uh, when is it going to, to happen? Uh, that... Yeah, it's something that everybody wants to do, but uh, it's not quite ready yet. Okay. Um, my bet is that it's gonna come, you know, late this year, maybe, you know, like September, November, December. Okay. You know. And what are the other developments you you have in the pipeline that uh, that will give you an edge against, let's say, Bitcoin uh, core, right? The... Yeah, so there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, maybe the most exciting to me, like, so there is like many people doing different stuff. Uh, but the one that is happening right now is the most exciting to me is UTXO commitment. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, um, I'm not sure if you know or if your public knows uh, what I, UTXOs are. I know what uh, UTX is, I, uh, you know, the, the non-spend. Okay, it's essentially no, no, the no, balance no. of yeah. who owns yeah, uh, what kind of money. I, right? I, have the, I am a mathematician myself. Okay, right? but so I, this is probably yeah. the most important yeah. stuff in Bitcoin. Yeah. But right now there is no way to know the UTXO set except replaying the whole story of Bitcoin Absolutely, uh, right. up to the beginning yeah. and, and at the end you yeah. have like the state of the yeah. UTXO yeah. and there is no other way right now. So the, in Ethereum uh, solves it differently, they have so like a balance on their yeah, account, Ethereum you don't have, have that. What on they call state roots right. um, that allows you to know the state at yeah. any time, yeah. but we don't have that. But um, UTXO coming money is essentially a simpler version of state root. Mm -hmm. um, where you commit into the blockchain uh, on a regular basis, what is the state of the UTXO? And so yeah. when you start a new node, you can ask from another node what is the UTXO set, and the other node is going to get you, and you can verify against the commitment that is in the blockchain that the other node is not lying to you. Okay. And that way, that way when you start a new node, you can download the UTXO set from another node and start validating from there without having to replay the whole I story. I understand, I understand, okay. That should make it easier to, you know, for people to run nodes. Okay, you are involved not only in uh, development, you are probably also uh, involved on the strategic side of, uh, of uh, Bitcoin Cash, how you approach the marketing and so on and so on. So what, are, what is your strategy, let's say, against Bit or generally in the market uh, because it's slightly different. I mean, your communication is, is different. What is your strategy uh, right now? Or well, there is not like you know one central ad. So yeah. a different group of people do marketing and they use different strategies. Mm -hmm. So that that I, I think they should try to unify a bit more. Actually, I've been okay. trying to uh, push them so that they do that because right now the message is a bit confusing. Some are like you know. Be, Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin, and some other like, oh, Bitcoin Cash is, is not Bitcoin, it's something else, and, right. and, okay. and they want so to demarcate themselves. So the message is a bit confusing right now. I would like mm -hmm. them to try to have a, a bit more of a unified message. I so what would be the unified message you would uh, see for Bitcoin Cash right now? Well, um, the way I see it is that it's essentially what I subscribed to when I get into Bitcoin um, mm -hmm. in 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, very cheap and very fast transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw the potential, you know, to, to change a lot of stuff there because you had a form of money. So, OK, let's let's take a step back uh, before Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. We had two main form of money that were used across the world the most. We had precious metal like gold and, and we had money. fiat money, yeah. right? And precious metal is scarce, it's fungible and all of that. It has all kind of good characteristics for money, mm -hmm. but it's not very convenient to use on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. right? And on the other end, you have fiat money, uh, which is much more convenient to use on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but it's not scarce. It's, uh, uh, well, you know, it's cold, scarce yeah. as long as you trust the yeah. central bank <laughs> to not print a ton of it, yeah. which end up happening one day or another every time, right? Yeah. right? And, and so you see like during human history, the same cycle that repeat where people use hard money like gold, and, and there's a civilization that develops and the civilization start printing fiat money and, and people then, switch to okay. that because it's more convenient and eventually you get hyperinflation, economic collapse and, and you wait for a while yeah, and you yeah. get a new civilization yeah. and it starts again, okay. right? And, and what I saw with Bitcoin is that suddenly you have something that has the characteristic of our money like gold, mm -hmm. but also can be very convenient to use like mm -hmm. fiat money. And so the best of two worlds. Yeah, so and I saw that a way to break, you know, that cycle. So literally, yeah. um, I see that as a, um, you know, civilization changing, 
technology can change the, the course of, of you know Absolutely. history at large. And, and, and you want that for Bitcoin Cash too? I and so mean, yeah, to so the... I want that for for Bitcoin Cash, and and I think that Bitcoin kind of like uh, went away from that path. It doesn't um, it doesn't look like to be very convenient anymore. It, it looks more to be a settlement layer mm -hmm. at the time, and so. Uh, that was not really the stuff I was interested in when I got into Bitcoin in the early days. Okay, but what about the, let's say, the strategy? Because I was like picking up the, the news that uh, you want to address more the developing countries like India were, or Venezuela, that where there's really need for cryptocurrency. And yeah, grow. they have crappy fiat money there, so right. obviously they make very good market. Uh, so uh, is there any other like steps or aspects of that strategy that you would like to, to talk about? Uh, like except for going for third, third world countries or th for the big population countries? Uh, well, there, there are a lot of people uh, working on that. I'm not sure I'm the best person to... Okay, uh, okay let's talk about you as a person because yeah. I saw you on uh, during a presentation, you were solving a cubic cube. Yeah. So tell me about that. Is it okay. like, uh, are you preparing for a world championship or is it like a hobby of you? No, or? yeah, it's a hobby of me. I used to be very serious. Actually, I did the world championship in 2009. Really? I you ended did? up okay. uh, 100 or 60 or something like that. So it's not like, you know, I was world champion, but I was not too bad either. Okay. Uh, nobody, I still do it as a hobby, but I don't train. Like, I'm not serious enough anymore to have, uh, you know, um, good enough level to go to world championships and but stuff you like that. you do it like ex exercise it as a to to uh, to train your mind or to uh, quick to i don't know i don't know it's an interesting challenge there is like a um, agility aspect of it and there is a mental aspect of it i, I don't know it's it's enjoyable it's, it's a nice hobby. okay do you have any like passion except for uh, cryptocurrencies uh, yeah, cryptocurrency, programming engine. Like I like technology and programming in general. Uh, I play some video game. Uh, what, play what, Rubik's cube. And uh, what did I you do know. before uh, coming to uh, to Bitcoin? Uh, you mean like professionally or? Yeah, professionally. Or... So uh, before working full time on Bitcoin, I was working at Facebook. I see. Okay. Um, I was working and making sure that the product that Facebook does. So at the beginning, I was working on making sure the product that Facebook does works well in Japan. Okay. Because like Japanese people, they have usage patterns that are different from anywhere else in the world. <laughs> like they use different devices to access the website. Okay. Uh, they speak uh, the different language, obviously, okay. but especially a language that. So you speak Japanese also, right? Uh, very very basics. Okay. Like not enough. Like you know enough to get by on a day-to-day -day basis, but not enough to have any interesting conversation. Okay, so is Japan the country where you met uh, with Roger Ver also? Uh, not really. No, when I was there, I. I yeah, I worked for Facebook. I made a few people there, but not for sure. Like I was not, you know, I was interested in Bitcoin already at the time, but I was not that big. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense for me to run after people like that over there. Okay. Uh, so did you did you have also some uh, like interest in uh, Austrian economy or in yeah, freedom? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I was definitely that? a libertarian kind of person before. Uh, before I got into crypto, uh, crypto like reinforced me even more in that in that tendency. Okay, but, so uh, that's, what, what that's is not something that was new to me. Yeah. So what is the best, let's say, book on Austrian economy or maybe on uh, f uh, freedom uh, economy or economy of freedom you um, have uh, read or that impacted you the most? Yeah, it's very what dependent on on what aspect you look at. So what sold this philosophy for me mm -hmm. is that whatever angle you approach it, it's kind of like it's consistent and it yield to the same point. Like, you know, you can consider the economics and what works economically and you yeah. can consider what is moral to do or what okay. is immoral to do. And you can consider, you know, like various stuff like that. And so kind of different like, access points, yeah, but you yeah. have so the that same was, core. That was a right. friend very compelling about that technology. It's like, okay. uh, not that technology, that philosophy. It's like Absolutely. whatever okay. angle you approach it, you kind of end up to the main place, same place, which means that it's probably um, something strong. In terms of economics, maybe, um, uh, there is a book, um, Economics in One Lesson. By Hazlitt, yeah. Um, this yeah, is the, actually the, the, the author kind of like is escaping my mind. Hazlitt so is sure. his, his name. But, I, this but, is actually the book uh, recommended by Roger Ver as well. Yeah, yeah so, I think it's a very yeah. good book. Yeah, um, very short but precise. It, it's yeah. short, yeah. it's easy yeah. to read and it yeah. goes over all the, the basics. Um, otherwise, if you want more of the philosophical aspect of it, maybe stuff by Lacan Rose uh, okay. are pretty good. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if what, you get those two, those two aspects, what about you get, like, what more. about the crypto space? When uh, who are the people uh, that you think in the crypto space have the more, most insight? When you, I don't know, look uh, look up to, maybe listen to, or what? Uh, that's uh, that's difficult to say because there are so many aspects of it. Yeah. Um, so, but maybe not on the uh, let's say technical side. Maybe more on the like uh, visionary side. Who would you? Uh, um, uh, there are a lot of old content by Stefan Molino. No, no, he, he, he doesn't talk that much about Bitcoin anymore. But uh, a few years back, he was talking about Bitcoin a lot. Is it in English or is it in French? No, it's in English. He's okay. a Canadian guy. This is okay. why he has a okay. French sounding name. But okay. Stefan Molino is, um, um, yeah, he's a Canadian philosopher kind of guy. He has mm -hmm. a show where he talks to people. Um, and he made some very, very, very good content about Bitcoin in the past and, um, you know, the economics of it and how that impacts society. You know, like he explained, for instance, how um, war is essentially funded by printing a shit ton of money. Right. Uh, and if it's become harder to print because you have hard money, then there is a um, ton of useless war that just, you know, like goes away because you cannot fund it anymore, for instance. Um, obviously, like that's a drastic oversimplification of what he says, right? But he has some very, very good content. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, tell me what is your thought on the development of the crypto world, uh, of the crypto space in the next months, maybe years, especially when it is uh, about Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, uh, I mean, how, how, how do you think will that develop? And also the, the cool crypto space. Maybe. So I think we are toward the end of a phase where there was a lot of excitement, a lot of new projects, and people ended seeing a lot of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we are transitioning from that to a phase where there is a lot of bad projects that are going to be without, and the good projects that are going to solidify. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you know because because those currency they have a very strong network effect. Absolutely. I guess we're going to yeah. get away from a position where there is like a a ton of currency at the top, but we have maybe three to five of them at the top because they make different trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And then the very long tail of, of stuff that are much less valuable. Um, in, yeah, maybe two years, three years, we're gonna... But that's just my fixation at least, you know, like take it for what it worth. Yeah, of course, I mean, the, <laughs> it's your, I mean your, uh, your perspective on that. What about uh, the, you know, the relationship between, between state and cryptocurrencies? How do you think will that develop? What do you uh, think? That's already? a very interesting <laughs> question. Uh, actually, I'm kind of surprised that states were not more aggressive against Until crypto now. so yeah. far, right? Because when you look at previous attempts to make independent money, stuff like uh, uh, Digicash e or the Liberty Dollar. Or, or E-Gold, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the government, there was like very aggressive government crackdown on people behind those stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm a bit worried that it's going to come maybe in the, in the coming years. But at the same time, you know, Maybe the politicians themselves, enough of them have enough crypto so that they won't do it. I don't know, you know. Uh, okay, I have, I, you know, I'm a YouTuber and I talk a lot about uh, crypto and I very often get these, these questions. What happens if, uh, if uh, government uh, uh, claps down, on, uh, claps down on, on crypto? If they, uh, you know, uh, block all the access to crypto that you, you know, that you can't exchange between crypto and fiat and uh, maybe, you know, just uh, bust all the exchanges, whatever, and or make even uh, crypto ownership illegal. What happens then? I mean, how, how would you, uh, can you imagine a world yeah, like so that, first, that, that when we have two systems, how would they yeah. Like so two first, independent systems. first, there is uh, some crypto. If that happened, there are some crypto that are you know completely doomed, like stuff like Ripple or um, uh, maybe Dash. You know, like people that have very identified people that are leading the stuff are mm -hmm. are gonna like you know if that happened, they're gonna be done. You know, from from one day to the other, they're gonna be gone. Okay. Uh, but for other crypto that are more decentralized, like Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, um, um, that's gonna be much harder, right? Like because you can. You can jail some people, but because there is no, you know, one boss of the whole stuff, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's going to continue to operate. So you and think there will be like a parallel economy that would develop and people wouldn't uh, yeah, switch is, between the systems. They would just pay for services. Yeah, this is what uh, I like, you know, if, right? if government crack down like crazy, uh, it's going to erode the trust in fiat, right? Because why would they do that unless they know that fiat is crap? 
Yeah, yeah and, it depends and, on the you know on the propaganda so, that is yeah, behind well, it. The, right? So I expect that on the short run you probably see the value of crypto going down and the usage going down. Yeah. But on the midterm to long term, you know, it's 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 not a good move, I think, for the government to do okay. that. Okay, I think I, I have run out of, of questions. It was great uh, okay. to, to hear your nice insights. To talk to you. Nice talking to you. Thank you for uh, taking your time. And uh, thank you guys for watching and see you from Acapulco. I hope you like this interview. Give me a thumb up, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell button in order not to miss the other interviews in this series, The Legends of Crypto. Share your comments below this video. Don't forget to provide your Biteball address. I will give away some Biteball in my next crypto video to those who provided the Biteball address. If you don't know what Biteball is, go to Biteball.org, inform yourself, install the wallet from there and provide your Biteball address below. But please don't spam the comments. Only the comments with real contributions will participate in the drawing. Share this video with your loved ones, with your friends. They will thank you for that. I talk here a lot about cryptocurrencies, about my experience with investing in crypto. I interview some of the most influential people into crypto world. And I talk also about the best entrepreneurs in the world, about self-made billionaires, how they think and how they act. I have interviewed 28 self-made billionaires so far in order to find out the secret of the mindset. So if you like this video, you will certainly like my other videos. Here you will find some of my best videos. Thank you from Acapulco. I wish you a fantastic day. Let's do something extraordinary today.